Gracious God, we come before you this morning in the middle of our lives with all their hiccups and um, unforeseen interferences. You are the God of life and flourishing and harmony and beauty and we put our lives with their disorders and incompleteness into your hands. We ask for your grace to live in harmony with you and your presence and your vision for this world. Amen. <coughs> okay, we are looking at really a time of major liturgical transition, so the fourth to the seventh century. In a sense, and my own time frame for today is continuing with uh, where Dean McGowan left off, early fourth century, late third century, and continue essentially until the rise of Islam. So Muhammad dies in 632, and with that, um, significant changes take place in the ecclesial world, especially around the Mediterranean, which is where uh, Christianity emerges and grows in the first uh, centuries that Dean McGowan mapped. And Christianity essentially grows uh, along uh, trading routes and in, at least in terms of the witnesses we have, in the major late antique cities around the Mediterranean. My um, little uh, map there um, suggests as much, although the map is heavily slanted in a sense towards um, uh, what will become Western and Byzantine Eastern uh, churches. Um, before I want to continue, before I continue, I simply want to acknowledge uh, churches beyond the Byzantine uh, church that we'll hear more about um, on Tuesday with Professor Spinks. Uh, it's important whenever we look at this map to realize that Christianity not only traveled west and north, but also traveled eastwards on trading routes, and uh, that a Syrian missionary reached China in the early 7th century. Um, he brought a slew of religious books, tradition tells us, uh, over 500 and sacred images and um, uh, Christianity was declared a, a, a tolerated religion. So while we focus on the Mediterranean and then Europe, uh, Christianity does not come to uh, East Asia with 19th century Protestant missionaries or with 16th century Catholic missionaries. It is there um, before Christianity ever made it to my part of the world, uh, uh, Central Germany. So I won't talk about that because I don't know enough about it, um, but want to flag it for you. You need to think about uh, how a Christian presence uh, in India and uh, China by the early 7th century. So this is our time frame for today. I think Dr. Ishak will actually be teaching a class about some of this stuff next semester. So if you're interested in that part of the Christian tradition and its liturgical life, um, 
uh, there is a class offered in that uh, uh, at YDS and ISM next semester. Now, this is where my first uh, list would have come in helpful. Let's look at the crucial for fourth century and I'll start by mapping some ecclesial, overarching ecclesial developments. I assume that most of you know this stuff, um, but it's important to simply list it as a reference to then build on that the liturgical developments. I'm sorry if I always lean leftwards. I, I do know you guys are there. It's just, and it's not a political statement. It's, um, who is uh, in Professor Morgan's early Christianity class? Whoa, I would have assumed more people. Okay, so this might be news for some of you, the ecclesial developments. Okay, um, usually in his, um, many people taking foundations also take at the same time early Christianity and then I know when I have to lecture on this Europe by this time in the third century or so and I can save myself some of this uh, listing of ecclesial developments but here we go. So crucial fourth century, what ecclesially marks this before we go? into liturgical details. And you will have this information on slides um, in Canvas. First, the big shift is that Christianity over the span of the early centuries grows from a minority religious movement to, in the fourth century, illicit, tolerated religion in the empire and by the end of the fourth century, the only licit religion of the empire. So a big shift from a marginalized, persecuted, at some points in time and in some places, religious minority to the religion of the empire. And it all happens in the span of the fourth century. Uh, second, uh, there are major theological struggles and developments. So by the 4th and 5th century, um, we see a Christological, major Christological and Trinitarian struggles um, being resolved to some degree, but this includes the loss of some Eastern churches that um, put a, a different weight, especially in some Christological questions. I think Professor Spinks will talk more about that. But for the uh, West and the Byzantine East, with the fourth and fifth century major Christological and Trinitarian issues are resolved. Third, the New Testament canon now is closed. It is no, there are no more questions around some books in the canon as there is uh, for in the early centuries. Does Revelation belong? The Shepherd of Hermas, is it in or out? Uh, with this point in time, the canon is considered established. So if you say New Testament, there is a fixed list that of books that, that can now be considered to be in. Fourth, we have with earlier roots, um, monastic movements growing like wildfire in initially the east, but soon also the west. And this has major liturgical um, consequences in the end. But for now, let's just say that ecclesially, uh, we, we have a, a renewal movement um, 
that is lasting, emerging in the third century, but then really flourishing in the fourth. A fifth point is that by the f and with the fourth century, it becomes clearer that Eastern and Western liturgical, the ecclesial traditions, and with them liturgical traditions, begin to grow apart. So the Western church is a Latin-speaking church by now. The initial liturgical language of Rome was Greek, but by the fourth century, it's, it's Latin. Um, slightly different theological concerns emerge, and the language, not only in terms of it being Greek in one, Latin in the other, or Syriac and Armenian and Coptic, um, but because the thinking diverges. Um, so we are beginning to see clearer demarcations between Eastern and Western ecclesial traditions. And finally, just a note on the West. If you wonder where the West is for this, for today, um, well, hmm. it's sort of a fuzzy and a moving thing, but let's um, do it like this. Now, if we just look at the West, Um, several particularities begin to shape that ecclesial uh, tradition. And I'm going to say this again at the end, but most of us are inheritors of that particular ecclesial tradition. It might be far remo removed in a sense from where you find yourself now or you will think it is far removed. But if you trace your ecclesial history back, most of you will have come out of that Western um, ecclesial tradition. So what's, um, what are some of the building blocks um, there? First of all, the liturgical language now really is Latin from Greek. I said that already. Um, Christianity begins to spread forcefully um, uh, north of the Alps with the fourth uh, century. Up until then, um, it is really a, a Mediterranean phenomenon, so we begin to see, and again via trading routes, oh I'm sorry Tanya, I'm not taking my sound with me, okay. Um, so there, there is an extension uh, uh, northwards, and if you look at the map again, yes I think you can tell, um, Rome is the only ancient, what comes to be called the, a patriarchal seat uh, that the West can claim. Uh, there is some um, fantasy involved in this construction. Uh, of, of what comes to be counted as a patriarchal seat. It's really the ancient centers of Christianity. Um, so Jerusalem, of course, Antioch, Alexandria, and then this newly founded city in the middle of nowhere, uh, Constantinople. <laughs> 
Um, and yeah, I won't go into that. Maybe uh, Professor Spinks uh, will. Um, the interesting thing about the only patriarchal seat in the West, Rome, is that it alone claims two apostles as the root of its existence or connected to it, Peter, and it's the two major apostles, Peter and Paul. Um, so it grows in theological importance. Um, with that, but it is of course also in the earlier centuries um, uh, the city of the emperor until Constantine moves, creates Constantinople um, for himself. Um, Yeah, some other sort of key things to remember um, for this important fourth century ecclesially. Ambrose baptizes Augustine in Milan in the, towards the end of the fourth uh, uh, century, 387, I think. Um, and that's a, that's a major moment uh, because it creates Saint Augustine and a whole theological a legacy that shapes the Western Church for centuries to come. Okay, a second block of uh, sort of a laundry list of developments, and this is liturgical developments that happen together with the ecclesial developments I just mapped. So liturgically, what happens? I should say in a, f a footnote, I think uh, Dean McGowan hinted at that, that with the fourth century, we also now have far more sources available. So we can actually sketch in a bit more depth or with some more clarity um, changes and developments in liturgy. Um, there, are, there is one key reason for why we suddenly have uh, more documents. The politics of documentation begin to favor Christian writings, with Christianity becoming the religion of the empire. Um, the writings aren't um, destroyed or lost or never made in the first place. So we have um, a, a substantial amount of sources now that we didn't have for earlier periods. That includes a good number of actual prayer text texts that are extant. Now let's a map some of the significant liturgical changes and again in the slides you'll have this laundry list um, the main points just uh, visible for you. First, uh, liturgies, Christian liturgical practices, worship in the narrow sense of the word goes public after the peace of Constantine. So Christianity emerges as a licit, tolerated religion in the, em in the empire, and in fact, the, the emperor seems to be a version of Christian. So it's, it suddenly is, Christianity is not only tolerated, but becomes privileged. Liturgically, that means Christians not only um, begin to worship in public, 
but they begin vast building projects. Constantine, for example, in Jerusalem, but also in Constantinople, builds public gorgeous sanctuaries. And as uh, uh, Dean McGowan hinted at, Christians adopt as their sacred sp space architecturally the Roman basilicas, which are public and where <clears throat> and continue to be public spaces. Um, another development that is important um, happening at the same time, and it's linked to these, to this um, liturgy going public, is that one of the previous centers of ritual gravity, namely cemeteries, we know that Christians gathered in cemeteries particularly around the graves of martyrs. And in fact, a, 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 book, a book came out about 10 years ago, um, the second church arguing architecturally that these assemblies in cemeteries were the larger assemblies by Christians because the little Places we have remnants of, like um, Dura, Europos, the church there, would have never been able to hold numerically the Christians that we knew were there. So the second church, uh, this um, Yale scholar argued, was actually the larger one. Um, in cemeteries, often lay-led liturgical practices, um, not necessarily linked to um, um, the church of a bishop. Be that as it may, with the fourth century, the public churches and the bishops that presided in them begin to make these prior ritual centers of gravity, particularly cemeteries, part of their ritual center of gravity in a cathedral. How do you do that? Well, you do what in some communities is still done to this day. You dig up the martyr or the saint and in procession carry them into the cathedral and bury them there. And lo and behold, the ritual center of gravity that was the cemetery now becomes the tomb of the saint in the church. Yes, there must be examples of that. I'm there must be examples of that. And they might have been smaller chapels that come to be linked with a cathedral, the main point being that the bishop now has authority, gains authority over the graves of the martyrs. Um, if you've read um, Augustine's Confessions, he, he describes the practice of his mother Monica in North Africa. Um, and she is in the habit of bringing baskets f full of meal cakes and bread and wine to the shrines of the saints on their memorial days. And Augustine says in passing that she wasn't the only one who did that. People were used to expressing their devotion for um, the martyrs um, in uh, that way. 
So Monica moves to Milan. She follows um, her son. And in the North African church, that practice had been discouraged by Ambrose, who tells her uh, basically um, not to do this. And she obeys. Uh, but in part, what we see there is a conflict between people's practices of faith and Episcopal control. OK, second major development that becomes visible, liturgical development. Extemporaneous prayer seems to lessen significantly with the rise of public worship. And we witness an increasing insistence on and availability of scripted, careful, rhetorically polished, Um, theologically orthodox praying. So the phrase that scholars have, or one scholar in particular, but it's been adopted, has been coined for this, is from freedom to formula in relation to praying in the Christian assembly. I should acknowledge that um, some of these materials are well covered in the reading for today. I'm putting a, not a different spin on it, but in my own mind, I've organized the materials slightly differently. So mm, two reasons why we see a move to from freedom in praying, extemporaneous praying, to formula, but two obvious reasons would be that in a public gathering and one that socially is beginning to climb up the la ladder of status, um, you want the, the language moves up. And that almost invariably means to a more scripted, more polished um, version of, of praying. And with struggles around Christology and uh, uh, understandings of the Trinity, Heightened attention is, is paid to uh, liturgical wording. So a, a good example is the, this early way of praying, Trinitarian praying to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Well, that comes to be understood in some ecclesial traditions as suggesting subordinationist Christological emphasis. So the three persons are actually not the same. The Father is more important than the Son, more important than the Spirit. So what happens liturgically, some communities um, begin to privilege another way of praying in the name of the Trinity. And it simply uh, puts the three persons of the Trinity next to each other, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, suggesting they are, the three are equal. Don't even dare to think that they are not. <laughs> 
So theological concerns shape practices of public praying. Okay, um, third point, one area where we actually begin to see less rather than more remnants of texts uh, is hymnody, which is somewhat counterintuitive, you would think, except that earliest Christian hymns begin to disappear with the fourth century, except for some really important remnants we still have to this day. Because one of the communities, um, ecclesial communities, that comes to be um, counted out as not orthodox, the Arians, have a very vibrant production of hymns for their own non-orthodox theological views. And so hymns come to be coded as dangerous territory. The heretics use them to great advantage uh, for their own theological expressions. And so the reaction is let's curtail the use of hymnody or only use biblical materials. And out go what we think was a richer affair of earliest Christian hymns. I think I'm at point four with my next point. Uh, by the fourth century, a firm order of ordained ministry and liturgical, minis uh, and liturgical leadership is now established. And it's both hierarchical and communal, this ordering of ministry. So there is uh, one bishop, a monarchical episcopate is the technical term, surrounded by a group of presbyters and deacons. So it's communal and hierarchical at the same time. We know from the earlier centuries that there were other ways of organizing leadership and liturgical ministries. They mostly fall by the wayside. One of the important ones uh, in uh, earlier centuries was leadership by charismatic gifts, uh, spirit-inspired in, um, charismatic gifts. That, of course, continues to be exercised in the church, um, but it is typically parallel and sometimes in challenge to the dominant pattern of uh, organizing ordained leadership, uh, which is uh, by this hierarchical and communal um, structure of a bishop with priests and uh, uh, deacons and the laity around with other um, liturgical functions um, being added in, of course, my favorite one is the doorkeeper. Um, that's a real liturgical function uh, in some early church uh, communities. So let's leave that. Um, well, lectors, of course, also are, are established. And um, we have choirs beginning uh, uh, to be formed uh, in uh, Dr. Ishak's namesake, uh, um, St. Ephraim's case, uh, he establishes a choir of women, uh, not just any women, but ascetic women, for uh, singing in, in liturgy, in worship. A fifth element that begins to mark liturgy, 
With worship in the fourth century fast becoming an important social force, that means liturgy accrues to itself not only social influence, but also social markers of influence and status. And that means um, especially heightened ceremonial. And many of the ceremonial additions that we see growing with the fourth century uh, come out of um, status-related re ceremonial of the time. So the bishop, for example, accrues to himself um, ceremonial of an pub um, important public official. And signs of status um, vestments, um, the the larger use of candles and incense, those are all not Christian specifics, uh, but are parts of the ceremonial life of the broader culture. How do you want to say importance in a given culture makes its way into Christian liturgy. Um, the fourth century isn't the beginning of that. I think it's always taken place. But with Christianity moving from marginalized faith community to the religion of the empire, it, it, it's a f noticeable and fast development. How it, just as an example of, and the scholars fight over this, but there might have been previous elements out of the broader culture um, shaping previous liturgical practices. We talked repeatedly, I think, about bathing practices and how oil was a part of that, um, and that might have shaped uh, baptismal practices. Um, one liturgical scholar has suggested that the imposition of hands after baptism that Tertullian describes might have had its source in the manumission of slaves in the Roman Empire. You liberate them by an imposition of hands. Well, you can see how for Christians who baptize, that is that that um, action speaks. It's an action of freedom. It also has biblical resonance. Let's do it. OK, next point, monasticism. Um, we talked about it as an ecclesial renewal movement. Uh, liturgically, it has vast ramification because it provides, creates an alternative, additional alternative site of worship and it gains in stature, and its liturgical emphases on a communal life shaped by a vision of constant prayer um, gains in spiritual importance. It's also an interesting renewal movement because certainly in its earliest roots, it is not priest-centered. Um, in fact, one of the early monastic fathers advice, was it Cassian? I think so, to his priests, uh, to his monks was flee the bishop. Because what does the bishop want to do? The bishop wants to ordain you and make you part of his ritual center of power and serve a parish. And there goes your monastic commitments to do nothing but pray, essentially. So flee the bishop. Um, 
And the, the abbot and the abbess do have, yes, for some of you that might be <laughs> uh, 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 an interesting uh, calling to contemplate, flee the bishop uh, when they come for you. Um, um, the, the abbot and abbess, the person um, presiding over a monastic community has extensive liturgical um, authority also. In the early, early Middle Ages, the, the Merovingian abbesses um, reconciled their sisters, so, meaning you would confess to your abbess and, and she pronounced forgiveness. So I think I've mentioned that before when we looked at uh, uh, devotional practices as they developed, sacramental practices as those developed over time. Some of these, this is a footnote, um, but I think it's, uh, it always strikes me as ingenious and compelling. In, in this monastic search for how to pray deeply and faithfully and constantly, uh, one monastic uh, community uh, in, um, in the East, Byzantine version of the East, um, established its community in such a way that they divided the monks into three groups for so that there would be continuous prayer always. So one third would pray, another third would sleep, and the other third would, I don't know, weave baskets or work in the monastic garden or whatever. But there was always a part of the community that prayed. So in that way, they sought to fulfill in their own community the, this imperative, monastic imperative, to pray constantly and without ceasing, which for one human alone is basically impossible. So how do you fulfill that, um, um, that charge, anyway? Um, just a word on the domestic sphere for even if what Dean McGowan said is true, namely the domestic sphere is not the one and only space of worship in the earliest centuries. Um, certainly in terms of liturgical scholarship, if, uh, it often simply drops off the radar screen with the fourth century. And it's scholars who study liturgical developments seem to think mostly, or seem to have thought, that there are really mostly two sides of S-I-T-E-S, -E of uh, uh, communal worship. It's either the parish, cathedral, or it's the monastic community. Well, no, the domestic site continues as a place of worship. We know less about it than about other sites because we have been looking in the wrong places. This is not a site that typically creates written manuscripts. So one needs to um, study other things than liturgical texts to get at the heart of these daily practices of the faith in domestic space. And I think I've said it a million times, domestic space doesn't mean the sort of bourgeois private sphere of the 19th and 20th century. The domestic sphere is larger. It includes, might include um, workshops, household animals, um, an extended family. So it, um, it's a larger site than the sort of 19th century private home. Gee. Couple of more important uh, developments 
what we see beginning with the fourth century and solidifying in the fourth century is a move from a diversity of local practices to a gelling of liturgical practices around larger ritual centers. Another way of putting this is that we see liturgical families or rites, R-I-T-E-S, emerge. So what was once a loose collection of individual Christian communities scattered around the Mediterranean, each probably with its own local liturgical usages and customs, now develops into a series of regional liturgical families around major Christian centers and cities. And um, Max Johnson in the reading gives you a map of these ritual uh, families that we really begin to see clearly with the uh, fourth uh, uh, century. At the same time, so what we see historically is a, is a shrinking of diversity around uh, major ritual centers that become uh, centers of liturgical rites and families is, is a cross-fertilization of liturgies. And in the fourth century, especially because we now also see with Christianity being a tolerated religion and then the dominant religion, a, um, a quite lively uh, pilgrimage industry emerging. Uh, and where do people, what's the primary site of pilgrimage that Christians want to go to? Well, it's where Jesus walked. So Jerusalem becomes an, a, a central hub of liturgical mixing because people from, Christians from all over the empire uh, make pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem some of them settling there. Um, but also be because pilgrims that go home or write home take practices with them that they find uh, compelling. Mm. Has anybody encountered Egeria? Okay, a couple of people have. She's one, and my favorite uh, pilgrim. She, she's a woman, um, uh, probably from the west, well, definitely from the western part of the empire, uh, who makes it her mission to, to travel eastward. And um, a previous scholarship used to describe her as chatty. <laughs> because she describes in great detail the liturgical practices of Jerusalem. Well, another way of describing her chattiness is to say she was really interested in liturgical practices. And she wrote down these detailed descriptions. But she didn't write them down for herself. She wrote them down for women, a community of women, probably ascetic women she had left behind. So we have a very detailed description of the liturgical life of Jerusalem in the late fourth century because of a woman who was fascinated by liturgical practices. Um, uh, more could be said. Some of the practices she describes in Jerusalem, particularly around Holy Week, are marked, of course, by the fact that in Jerusalem, Christians could map a path 
of walking where Jesus walked in the last few days of his life and following that path. Well, that mimesis, that imitation of following Jesus, actually travels west as a devotional practice. Um, you saw some of that in Professor Buchinger's uh, lecture of how we begin to see in the West practices of burial connected with Good Friday. You entomb Jesus. So anyway, more could be said. Mm. Couple more things briefly and then some concluding thoughts. Another important development with the fourth century is that a liturgical calendars, slightly different in East and West, become visible. We talked a bit about that when we looked at rhythms of time. But it is clearly um, with the fourth century and documentations that we begin to see actual calendars. Um, and they diverge somewhat between East and West. Uh, but with the fourth century, they also begin to grow exponentially with seasons growing, um, saints' calendars growing, um, and um, manifold editions for what in the fourth century is still a fairly rudimentary um, calendar, Christian calendar. Um, I'm going to skip uh, um, saying anything much about baptismal initiation and Eucharistic rites, except to say they both become more intricate, um, um, extended liturgical celebrations. And in both cases, probably as a, a result of um, Christianity going public, they take on a different tone, uh, namely um, an emphasis on how awe-inspiring uh, uh, and crucially important both baptism and Eucharist are. Uh, remember that this is a point in time when it becomes socially advantageous to become a Christian. Okay, a few overarching thoughts about liturgical development in this century or centuries what I've said mostly continues, begins in the fourth and continues to the seventh. The first point, and it's an important one, is this. The process of the formation of liturgy as we now think about it from earliest beginnings does not move from a sort of pure, pristine, unified core that begins with Jesus and then uh, uh, multiplies and grows and gets more messy and through the centuries. On the contrary, uh, from the story of origin we now tell it, it goes in the opposite direction that initially there is diversity and pluriformity and, and different uh, small Christian communities worshiping um, in diverse ways. And the fourth century, it's like an hourglass almost, but that breaks down in the end, uh, that analogy. Um, with the fourth century, there's actually a move towards more uniformity 
of, of practice and theological understanding. Now, a second point, equally important. Mm, it doesn't bite the first one, but it, it adds uh, uh, something onto that. With the fourth century and the emergence of these liturgical rites families becoming visible around major centers of late antique Christianity, there is an increasing unity of practice within families, but diversity between. So while um, what ends up in the West is the Roman rite um, might suck up diverse practices into itself, it begins to look more different from the other families. So unity, increasing unity in families, increasing, increasing diversity between families. And liturgies, this is the third point, liturgies grow within themselves and continue to grow within themselves. So if you take just the Roman rite, it continues to expand not only in ceremonial but also in liturgical stuff that gets piled on. And what happens when you have too much liturgical stuff? Well, a renewal movement comes around and says, back to the simple origins. And you have that throughout the Middle Ages with the Cistercian order, for example. But you see it big time with the 16th century and the Protestant reformers. 